my involvement with Tibetan Buddhism started when I was a college student at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This was uh, between the years of 1957 and uh, 1960. And in my third year, I believe, I met a uh, Harvard student at a uh, famous coffee shop of those days called Tula's Coffee Shop in, uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, Mass, and uh, near to Harvard and also near to MIT, where I was a student. I met, I met a Harvard student uh, through a, another Harvard friend of mine named uh, Foster Dunlop, and his name was uh, Robert Thurman. Now, uh, we got to be a little friendly during that year, and the next year I had heard that he, he had uh, left college and gone to India and, and uh, met the Dalai Lama and, and actually became ordained as the first Westerner to uh, receive monk's vows in Tibetan Buddhism and from the none less a figure than the Dalai Lama. When I uh, returned to the States, when he returned to the States the, the, the next year, uh, the Dalai Lama had, had told him that there's a uh, Mongolian Lama living in New Jersey and you should go see that Mongolian Lama. Well, uh, Thurman went to see that Mongolian Lama, his name was uh, Geshe Wanjiao, and he was part of a group that that came to the States right after World War II. They were comic Mongolians and somehow uh, a whole group of them had been uh, located to uh, Washington, New Jersey. And uh, we heard that uh, Geshe Wanjiao, the leader of, of that group, the Lama, who was the leader of, of, of their group, uh, lived behind a billboard in, in Washington, New Jersey. Well, Thurman had been to see him uh, for quite a while uh, before he told his friends, you've got to come and meet this amazing Lama. And well, uh, gradually, many of his friends uh, did go to meet uh, Geshe Wanjiao. Uh, Geshe Wanja would teach for about an hour a week to the Westerners on Sunday afternoons, and, and before long there was a there was a pretty good group of, of people uh, listening to what he had to say about Tibetan Buddhism. Well, that was my introduction to Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, about a year after that, the uh, the lady that I was uh, with and uh, later married uh, in Karina and I decided uh, to go traveling around the world and uh, we told Geshe Wajal about our plans to travel uh, perhaps to uh, to India and, and uh, Geshe Wajal said, oh wonderful, you're going to see the holy places, it's a pilgrimage. Well we hadn't thought of it uh, as being a pilgrimage but we knew there were holy places there and so this was a good rationale for, for us to, to, uh, to uh, leave the U.S. and uh, be on our merry ways to, to Asia. Uh, we uh, finally arrived in, in Asia, and the, it was in uh, February of 1965. Uh, we arrived in, uh, in uh, Bombay and uh, made our way to, to Delhi, where we had in, been invited to stay with another Harvard friend of mine named Buddy Eisenberg, whose family worked for the Ford Foundation there, and uh, they had invited us to stay with them for a while. Well, uh, the, 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 the parents of Buddy were not too pleased that uh, Buddy had made this invitation without, without clearing it with them beforehand, and so we were only allowed to stay there for a few days. So after a few days, we were told we had to we had to go find somewhere else to stay, and uh, Buddy suggested that we uh, that we go to a to a uh, a Hindu temple uh, called Birla Mandir, which is an old Delhi. Now in those days, the the people who were traveling and who uh, were young people like we were and and who didn't have much resources uh, would try to stay for a few days in one temple and then for a few days in another temple. The Sikh Gurdwaras were always the place where you could stay for, for a day or so. 
Well, at the Berlavan we were allowed to stay there for three days. And uh, as soon as we got to the Berla Mandir, I saw somebody who just, who just didn't look right being in the Berla Mandir. He was dressed differently from all the other Hindu ascetics that were, that were there and the sadhus. And uh, he, was, he was dressed in a t-shirt and, and uh, what looked like a skirt, and he didn't, he didn't really look Indian. And I thought, well, maybe this guy's a, a Tibetan. So uh, I just took note of, of, of him and uh, never said anything. Uh, went about our business in and out of the out of the temple. But one morning, we had stopped to have a uh, cup of tea in the chai shop right across the street from the from the uh, Birla Mandir, which was in the most crowded part of Old Delhi, called Chandi Chow, which is uh, if. Uh, to try to describe it would be almost impossible because it's traffic of every kind of description and variety going in every direction at once. And that was that was Chandi Chow from those days and it probably is very similar these days. Uh, sitting having tea in the in the chai shop and watching watching all this activity going around me, we, we noticed that in the back of the chai shop this Tibetan looking guy had, had settled into a seat and uh, he was having his cup of tea and, and uh, we saw him uh, pay his bill and get up and leave. Well, uh, he, it looked like he, he forgot something and what it looked like was a scroll. And uh, so I uh, went for, to his seat where, where the scroll had been left and I grabbed it and I, I tried to f took, take a look and see where he'd gone. He'd gone into that melee of, of uh, bullet carts and rickshaws and motor bikes and motor scooters and, and, and trucks and every other vehicle that you could imagine and cows at the same time uh, working their way through through the intersection to see what they could eat and I try to find uh, this Tibetan guy among the crowd. Well I, I spotted him and I, and I ran after him for about a block or so and I finally caught up with him and I was panting, I was out of breath and I, I was happy I had caught up with him and I, and I gave him the, the scroll. And uh, he, he, you know, he uh, didn't seem surprised that, that I had the scroll that he had left behind. And you know, he didn't seem surprised that it was me who had you know, returned it to him. And he didn't seem to be surprised about anything. And he just took it and was, was about to, to go, go on his way when I, when I asked him, well, what is, what is that? And he said, uh, let me show you. He spoke uh, a little English. And he unfurled the, uh, the scroll, which was a Tibetan tanka, which I had only seen a very few of uh, before that time. But the, uh, the tanka was a tanka of uh, Padmasambhava and his eight manifestations. And uh, the uh, Padmasambhava in this tanka was a fairly young Padmasambhava, it looked like in, the, in his uh, early 20s, about the same age I was. And uh, so I looked at the, uh, the tanka and, and I looked at the, the central figure, Padmasambhava, and I, I asked the uh, Tibetan guy, well, who's that? And he said to me, that's you, isn't it? And I think that was my real connection to what later followed as a whole lifetime of study of Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, his name uh, was Tartan Tulku. He invited me to his, uh, to his rooms at the Ladakh Bhogvihar, and he started to lecture me about emptiness, which I had never heard of and I knew nothing of, but he, he gave me a little understanding of, of what emptiness was from that lecture. Uh, he asked me what, what my plans were, and I told him, well, I had planned to go to, to North India, to the uh, Kulu Valley. I, was, I had heard about this place called Tsopema, or Rawalsar in, in Hindi. Uh, and uh, Tsopema in Tibetan uh, means Lotus Lake, and it was a holy place of Padmasambhavas, uh, where he, in fact, had... Uh, had uh, met the daughter of the king of that locality, the king of Sahor, and, uh, and entered into some kind of friendship with, with her that uh, 
people were jealous about and uh, people raised an outcry about that. In fact, so much of an outcry that that they were that they were it was decided that that, that they were up to something uh, uh, that illicit, and and uh, and they were sentenced to be burned uh, at the stake, and they were burned, and they were burned, and uh, they didn't burn. The the uh, fire turned into the uh, lake, the Lotus Lake, uh, for which the uh, locality is named, so Pema. And uh, on that lake, there are mysterious islands, which are only in one other place of the world. And these islands, uh, the Lamas, who live in the caves above the, uh, above the Lotus Lake, say that these are the, these Lamas are, these islands are, are moved by the spirits of, of uh, uh, Pamasambhava and his two consorts, one of which was the daughter of Sapar Mandarava, and the other, uh, the famous Yeshi Tsogyal. So, uh, that's where I was going. I told uh, Tartang Tulku, uh, we hope to go there. We heard stories about some Lama who could fly, who lives in the caves above Topema, and so uh, we want to check it out. And he said, well, I know the Kempo, or the abbot of that monastery. Let me give you a, a letter of introduction. And he quickly wrote a little letter of introduction. And, and uh, he said, well, I'm going to be at the Nkulu Valley. Pretty soon, maybe we'll bump into each other. Well, I, we, uh, we started off uh, for uh, the Kulu Valley. We never, never got to the Kulu Valley. At the bus station of Mandi, which is the nearest small town to Tsopema or Rewalser, we saw some English uh, people in the bus station and they were waiting for another bus. And so we started talking to them, where are you going? Oh, we're going to Tsopema. And, uh, uh, we said, well, we're, we were going to go there too, but we're going to go to the Kulu Valley first and then come back down and see Sopema. And, and, and the uh, Englishman who uh, was the leader of their group, his name was John Weir Hardy, he said, well, why don't you come to Sopema? We have a job for you. You can teach the Tibetan kids English. And uh, uh, we're sponsored by the National Christian Councils and we can uh, give you a house, we can give you uh, a sustenance, and we can give you a small allowance. And so uh, we said, well, we'll try. <laughs> and not, never having taught English before, not knowing uh, what a Tibetan community was like, uh, we uh, got on the next bus for, for Tsopema, where once we were there, I showed my letter from Tartan Toku to the abbot of the monastery, his name was Kempo Rabje. Yingma Monastery there, there were two monasteries, Yingma and Kaju, and uh, we were very, very much welcomed there. Now, I started teaching the uh, young lamas English, and I taught in the monastic school, and I taught in a secular school. In the monastic school, some of the little lamas that I taught English to uh, in um, 1965 and 66, now are well-known lamas in the in the United States. Two of them are, are very uh, still very closely uh, uh, connected with one uh, who was there. They were both twelve or thirteen at the time. One was uh, Kempo Tsewa Dongyal, who is the the younger brother of the famous uh, Ken, Kenshin Palin Sherab, and the other was a uh, a, a young lama named uh, Lama Rinchen Punso. Uh, my uh, connections with those lamas have have continued to this very day, and uh, today's date is uh, 2008, March 1st. March 1st. I'm still very much connected with them, and now uh, uh, the uh, Kempos have become very famous lamas. They have centers all around the world. They have one of the most beautiful retreat centers in the United States, in upstate New York. They have centers in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, in uh, Tennessee, uh, out west. They have uh, several centers in, uh, in Russia. They have, uh, they have uh, several centers in India, one in Sarnath, and, uh, and uh, 
another uh, another uh, center I can't recall. Uh, it's uh, north of Delhi. Uh, can't recall the name. Uh, uh, Lamarinchin now he's uh, living in uh, New York. He became the secretary of uh, Dujam Rinpoche and. Uh, I met uh, Ducham Rinpoche, who became my teacher in, at uh, Sopema while I was uh, teaching English those first uh, six months. Uh, Ducham Rinpoche came to uh, Sopema during that time and uh, gave the Rinchen Terzo Wang, so the rediscovered uh, teachings. And uh, the Wangs or empowerments went on for three, three months. It was an incredible uh, amount of activity among the Lamas, and there were about ten to twelve thousand uh, yogis who came out of the, the wilds to be to be there for for this empowerment of Dujim Rinpoche. This is the first time that I met Dujim Rinpoche, who was later to become my teacher. At the end of the uh, of that first year of uh, teaching the uh, Tibetan kids, and I not only taught at the monastic school, but I also taught at the secular school, uh, which which uh, uh, was uh, was uh, uh, Kaju, and uh, had such a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, living very uh, simply. Uh, uh, discovering how to teach English, having a, a, a very uh, satisfying and happy time uh, teaching English to these uh, Tibetan young monks and and uh, and and, uh, and children of the lay community that uh, that I I I, I'm, I think uh, uh, in in retrospect it was one of the greatest years of my entire life. And we lived very simply then. We, we had the simplest of food. Sometimes sometimes it was only uh, rice and dal, and sometimes it was just potatoes and, and, and dal, but yet it was, uh, it was delicious. And, uh, and we had a few rupees to, to go in, into, the, uh, into the local uh, confectioners or, or, or uh, local, local uh, guy who made the, uh, the samosas and the pakoras and and have those kind of those kind of snacks. Well, after about a year, the Indian government decided that uh, uh, why are these Americans, uh, you know, uh, so concerned about the about the Tibetans? They they got to get out now. If you're British, it's okay to stay, but if you're American, you you got to go. So uh, we had to leave that that wonderful wonderful experience, and I we. Went uh, from Benares back down to, to New Delhi, where we're you know sort of the center of things, and it was on our our route. And in, in New in New Delhi, I, I heard uh, I heard a rumor that uh, somebody told me that the government of India was offering scholarships to people who were interested in Sanskrit, and uh, all you had to do was go and have an interview with the minister of education and. You might be a, a lucky scholarship winner. Well, I decided to go for it, so I went and had an interview with the Minister of Education, and half an hour later, I had won a scholarship to a choice of three universities in India. One was the uh, was the uh, Shanti Niketan uh, in uh, Calcutta. Uh, the other was uh, Punjab University in Chandigarh, and the third choice was. Uh, Sanskrit University in Benares. Well, I knew that Tartan Tulku was a research scholar at Sanskrit University in Benares. And so I said, I want to go to Sanskrit University in Benares. And so I won a three-year full tuition scholarship to Sanskrit University in Benares, where I reconnected with Tartan Tulku as soon as I showed up at the university, he started uh, teaching me. He taught me the uh, the blessing section of the Guru Yoga, which, uh, and uh, that's 
not usually uh, that's not usually talked about until you you've done some uh, preliminaries, especially refuge and bodhicitta and the mandala offerings and so on. But he went right to the right to the core and, and uh, immediately I was practicing the, the blessing section of, of uh, Guru Yoga. And not and not only that, but he would talk to me every day. I would go for an interview in his room, and uh, he would talk about Dzogchen. and. Uh, he taught me uh, Dzogchen in a way that the old masters taught their students one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, questions uh, which I would have to come back with the answers to the next day. Uh, look at the nature of mind. Is it inside your body? Uh, next day I would have to come in and, and explain what I had experienced by trying to find out where, where my mind was. And so, uh, in, the, in that way, within a, a year or so, I had become very close to Tartan Toku, and I was beginning to help him in his efforts to uh, publish some of, of the, the rare and lost Tibetan manuscripts, especially those of Mipam Rinpoche and Longchen Rajam. And uh, Tartan Toku always told me, uh, I'm not a teacher. You need a teacher, I'm not a teacher. So he said, you either go to Kunulama or Dujam Rinpoche if you want a teacher. Well, the next time I had an opportunity, I, uh, I uh, went to Dujam Rinpoche, and so I got to know a little bit about Dujam Rinpoche. Uh, later, uh, Dujam Rinpoche came to the States. He first came in 1972. I was one of the first six people uh, in the U.S. to take refuge with him. The other five people were uh, John Giorno, uh, Jim Valby, Allen Ginsberg, and I believe it was Peter Orlovsky who was with him, and uh, Alan Ehrlich. Uh, in 1976, we helped to bring Dujan Murphy back to America, where he established the Yeshi Ningpo uh, Dujim Centers in America uh, uh, with his son uh, Chinli Nurma Rinpoche or Dungse Rinpoche is the head of the, of the East Coast and uh, Gyacho Rinpoche is the, the head of the, of the West Coast. In the meantime, in 1976, I believe, we had also helped Lama Kala Rinpoche uh, get, to, um, get to America and establish his Kajun Zamlin Kunkya centers in, in New York City and then later his, his, re, his retreat centers. So uh, Tartan Tulku, one of the summers that we were at Sanskrit University, left of course at the end of the, at the, end of the semester for, uh, we usually would go to hill stations, you know, a place to cool off because was, weather was heating up quite a lot by, by the end of May in Benares. Uh, you wouldn't want to be there. And uh, well, one summer I, I and my wife went to uh, to uh, sort of a, 